Recording in progress. <laughs> Okay, we'll get started here with our introduction. Yep, so this is uh this is edition number eighty three on our Zoom rock room. So uh thanks for everybody for hanging in there and uh anybody in there new tonight, welcome aboard as always the Zoom Rock Room sponsored by Lair Architect in Lake Havasu City. I always encourage people to uh, email them and say hi and I know a couple of you have done that in the last couple of weeks because I've seen uh I've seen uh, Marcelo's replies back to you, so uh, appreciate you letting them know that you are paying attention. Um, the Institute in Waynesboro, uh, they have somewhat of a pretty busy uh, rest of May and going into June. I'd like to find out their activities, uh, you can go online or you know, go to info at natureandcultureinstitute.org. One event they have coming up actually is this uh, Saturday at the uh, Monterey Pass, which is up on the South Mountain, Blue Ridge Summit. They're having their grand opening of the Civil War era interpretive garden. A lot of work has gone into that. And if you're a Civil War buff, you need to go to the Monterey Pass Museum and uh, hear about the encounter that happened there the day after the end of Gettysburg. It's really a cool story, and that group has done a, an amazing job on trail uh, building, construction, deck, uh, decks up on top of the mountain, and all that. They also do have a bird watching group, first and third Saturdays of each month, and they do vary in location, but you, again, you can check out or email them uh, or check the website for all that. Of course, Crystal Cove Collective in uh, the Lower Allen Shopping Center in Camp Hill. Uh, Mike and Krista, happy to see you in their huge uh, sh uh, building, I've heard. And they're filling spaces up uh, for other vendors to be in there selling and so forth. So uh, stop by if you're up in that area, 2208 Gettysburg Road in Camp Hill. A reminder, June 25th, that's only about uh, close to a month away from now, um, the Zoom Rock Room will be gathering at the uh, at the uh, Greenwood Furnace. Our host Paul Fagley will be uh, taking care of us that day. He does have a pavilion reserved, and the uh, Zoom Rock Room administration will take care of the hamburgs, hot dogs, rolls, and all the condiments. And we ask you to bring the, uh, your favorite covered dish or something to share with the rest of the group. Uh, if you are going, please let me know so I can add you to the uh, growing list of uh, folks who are going. Uh, James Webb Telescope is uh, getting very, very close to officially getting up and running. Uh, as I told you, I believe the last time we were together that all tests have been um, successfully done on the James Webb Telescope to calibrate all the instruments. And here's one of the first pictures that was taken uh, compared to an older uh, picture from the, uh, the Spitzer observing, Observatory uh, orbiting the Earth and compared to what the James Webb Telescope sees the area on the right. So uh, remarkable uh, difference there. And uh, we're just really excited about seeing what James Webb is going to do and how many astronomy books are going to have to be rewritten 
as time goes on and James Webb finds things that aren't supposed to be there. Uh, Jones Geological Services coming up. Um, I did send a link out to uh, the meeting tomorrow night uh, with the York County uh, Civil War Roundtable uh, with the Geology and the Gettysburg Campaign. If you want to uh, zoom in that, I, th I think they're also doing a YouTube Live. Uh, and it, if you're in the York area, it is being held at the York History Center, 250 East Market Street in York, 7 o'clock. You may uh, tune in or, or stop in. May 21st, this Saturday, uh, this is what I'm calling the, the B&J program. That's not peanut butter and jelly. It's uh, Brittany and Jerry, uh, Sweet Arrow Lake. We're doing a double hitter for them. It's Earth and, it's, uh, Earth and Space Day. 3 o'clock, we're doing an a, a jelly program uh, around the uh, Sweet Arrow Park. And at 8.30 at night, uh, we're go hopefully going to be showing people things through telescopes. If it is cloudy, we are going to have a, uh, a program lined up uh, to, uh, to do with astronomy, too. So that's at the Lakeside Pavilion off the uh, Lake uh, Waterfall Road at Sweet Arrow Lake, just east of Pine Grove Furnace. Uh, on June 26th, the uh, Riverfest is returning to the Wrightsville, Columbia, Marietta, Lancaster, and York counties uh, er after the COVID. And on Sunday, June 26th at noon, uh, at least I will be leading a uh, geology hike along the Northwest Lancaster County River Trail from Columbia, crossings up to the St. Charles Furnace, which is about, about a mile walk uh, one way, and talking about the geology in that area, plus what else is along the trail. So. That's a fun weekend, uh, draws a lot of people, and uh, I'll be there at noontime on Sunday because obviously Saturday is Greenwood Furnace. Uh, I told you about this before, Cadoras uh, Park, State Park in Hanover, uh, starting a new program, Experience Cadoras Outdoors, and we'll be there fossil digging. We have brought down a truckload of rocks from our new, new Ringgold site up in Schuylkill County. And we're going to let anybody uh, who wants to pound on rocks uh, try to find some fossils. So Friday, June 17th, 4 to 9. Saturday, uh, 10 to 9. Uh, all day for that festival. The Zoom Rock Room schedule. Next time we're going to see you in a few weeks, June the 7th. Uh, Bart Stump will be talking about the petroglyphs along the Susquehanna River. Uh, mostly in the lower Susquehanna River Basin. June 21st, uh, I'll be doing the geological journey through South Mountain in the Frederick Valley, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. July 5th, just after the fireworks, we're going to show you uh, geology of York County. July 19th, we're going to talk about the Pennsylvania Heritage Geologic Sites. Uh, there will be some prizes uh, available for, for that night because we're going to ask you a, a question or so about the heritage geology sites. In August, we're still awaiting some uh, confirmations on presenters. We're expecting a couple of college professors to be joining us sometime, but that may not be until they get back into school in September or, or uh, even late August, maybe. And of course, we don't want to leave out our, our hero, our the Dirt Man, Andrew, Epic, uh, Extreme Cody, with all the videos, and of course what he's been doing for the uh, Zoom Rock Room. Um, by the way, I do want to acknowledge uh, Steve Lindbergh's uh, Saturday trip to New Paris, Corey, for the uh, Pennsylvania Rock Hounders Facebook page. Uh, huge turnout, a lot of good finds, and this is where Andrew's going to take over to show you this version's, uh, this version's uh, um, video. So Andrew, go ahead. All right, hey everybody. Uh, so Saturday was a great day. We uh, all met up over in um, Bedford County at the New Paris Quarry. 
Uh, I, if you all remember CND Canal Report, I was interviewing Jason Kowinski, the fossil guy, and he is with us tonight. And he was with me on Saturday, so uh, it was a lot of fun meeting with him and uh, finding trilobites and trilobite corner with everyone. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to share that with everybody. Um, this is a really fun uh, Dirt Man's report that I just finished about an hour ago. So everyone, please enjoy. Here we go. Hey, it's Fossil Guy here. Dirt Man here with another special report. Today, we're in the new parish quarry in Bedford County. We're looking for uh, trilobites, brachiopods, all kinds of green fossils, slurry and devonian up in Triglite Quarter here. It's going to be awesome. And we got right to work. Break the poison ivy vines. <laughs> Too late. Touched it once. Oh, yeah. Looks like Jason already found something cool. It's a little pigeon. Oh, look at that. That is amazing. Awesome. <laughs> Let's First keep bond. digging. Ooh. Check that out. Big one on that side. Little, two little ones on that side. I'm here with John. He just pulled out both sides of a trilobite tail. Look at that. That's the actual trilobite there, and that's the mold. He just both busted open this limestone, and there's actually a crystal pocket. So not only is there a crystal pocket, there is a trilobite too. The finds kept on coming. Here with Andrew, and he's got a good one. Oh yeah, look at that. Very cool. Great awesome. job, Andrew. Good day. Hey, if you're not bleeding, you're not mining. Did a good one there. <laughs> Here's to you, Herkimer Joe Sukup. Then, the fossil gods sent one my way. Wow! Holy crap! Look at that! <laughs> It's not a trilobite, but it is the biggest shell. Oh, wow. Look at them all. <laughs> oh, that's huge. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's like wow. everything. It's like every step <laughs> penis. You see how, oh, that's cool. how big that one is? Yeah. Let's get that all cleaned out. I mean, that, look at that detail. That's pretty. <laughs> big tail. Big tail. Giant. All right, I'm here with Nate, and he just busted this rock open. Look at that. He's got both sides as well. Nice big tail. Very cool. Keep on digging. I think we found them all. No. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, a, that's tail. a tail. Yeah, that's oh, a that's tail. Cool. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I moved because I'm sitting, I'm saying I'm sitting on one. That's why I don't find him. And it was. It was right underneath of me. Check out that color. Ooh, that is very pretty. I forget the uh, species or the genus name, but. Look at that. Nice. That's nice a color. perfect shelfer right there. Looks like it's been uh, leached, leached white. Oh. Yeah. Almost like the uh, ferns at St. Clair. Yeah. The PA Rockhounds, also known as the Anti Club Club, all had such a great time that none of us even realized the wall of rain devouring the picturesque countryside and heading our way. I have a special treat here. It's pouring down rain, but this is Marvin Miller. He owns the property adjacent to this quarry, and there's something very special on it. Sinkholes. One of the sinkholes is called sinkhole number four, and they found over 3,000 fossil remains out of that one sinkhole. That's very cool. These pits have mammal bones from going back to the Ice Age, and they're on his property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of them, like, are smaller animals. The, the largest animal found out of that sinkhole was called a long nosed peccary, which is an extinct animal. Wow. They found uh, an extinct eastern elk and it had a flint arrowhead wedged in the neck vertebrae at the sixth, seventh vertebrae, but it survived the wound. It was done as a calf, survived. Wow. It only lived about 10 years and then fell into the sinkhole and died as a mature bird. Wow. About 810 AD. Wow. Can you imagine that? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, very unique property. Yeah, this is a very important geological site for all mankind. Yeah. Very cool. Yes. Well, it's starting to rain even harder. Yeah. We're going to get inside. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 
Pretty much everything in this corner is covered with fossils. Bracks, gastropods, trilobites, and everything you can possibly think of. Crinoids, everything are on these rocks. You can pretty much just walk around and throw them in your bucket. I'm here with Bob. He found a really cool fossil that's still alive. Oh yeah. <laughs> Check that guy out, nice old corn snake. <laughs> I'm here with Brianna, and she's quite excited. She finally found one, and it's a good one. Look at this. Very cool, My huh? First trilobite. So cool. That is a very good one. Delmantu was a real common trilobite in the Devonian period. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, they got up to a foot in length uh, and had a very distinctive um, huh? thorax. And, uh, and cephalon. That's the more common trilobite in here. There's also green ops. I'm here with Pam and just looking at some of her finds and what I thought was kind of special is Steve Lindbergh has identified this as a trilobite burrow from when it burrows down into the ground like that. I've never personally seen one. Great find, Pam. Cool. Thank you. I had such a blast today. Yeah, it was a great day. Yeah, it was. It's been a great day. We found some awesome stuff here in Trilobite Corner. I'm Dirt Man. I'm the fossil guy. Bringing the geology to you from here in Bedford County. Back to you, Jerry. Man, what a wonderful video. Everybody give, give Andrew and Jason a big round of applause and Steve for putting all that together and making it happen. We may have to go back out there again uh, sometime in the future with the uh, Zoom rock room. But uh, Andrew, we thank you again for everything that you've uh, that you've done. Uh, just not for the Zoom rock room, but uh, uh, for rock counting in general. And when I find that complete dinosaur in your county, I'm looking for, uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I asked uh, Andrew since he. Uh, since he uh, was responsible to get Jason uh, with us, uh, I gave the responsibility to Andrew to introduce Jason, and on we go. All right. <clears throat> so I, <clears throat> Jerry might need to mute again. All right. So uh, Jason is with us tonight. He's a teacher, a paleontology enthusiast. He and his fossils have been featured in over a dozen publications. He's contributed articles and specimens to museums and his website, which personally for me has been an influence and a great re uh, resource, has become a standard reference for both amateurs and pe uh, professionals alike. He's also really cool to mine with. I learned that on Saturday. So with, it is now my honor to introduce the fossil guy, Jason Kowinski. Uh, for those uh, that don't know me, I uh, sat in your last meeting too, but um, if you don't know me, I run the Fossil Guy website. Uh, it has a goal of just getting people interested in fossils of paleontology. And one of the things I like to concentrate on is just bringing together like amateurs and professionals. Uh, that way, important specimens that amateurs find can get donated to like appropriate museums and stuff. Uh, I was an uh, inaugural advocational liaison to Paleontological Society, which uh, our goal is to include amateurs in the professional field of paleontology and build connections between professionals and amateurs. Um, so uh, Andrew uh, asked me uh, to do a presentation. So I gave him like a list of topics and stuff. And uh, one of the topics was the importance of uh, amateurs in the field of paleontology. Uh, so if you don't like the topic, throw tomatoes at him and not me. So let me uh, share my screen here and see if this works. I'll take some tomatoes. It's all good. <laughs> okay. Um, does everyone uh, can everyone see that screen? Can you get a thumbs up with anybody? Okay. Okay. That is all working. Yeah. So uh, basically, the, the talk here is the importance of amateurs in the field of paleontology. Uh, usually at conferences, uh, the talks are about twenty minutes to half hour. Uh, Andrew said so I have like an hour here, but I won't. I won't take the whole hour and make everyone snooze and fall asleep there. Um, but when uh, people think of am amateurs, a lot of people just think of like uh, own sitting like on dining room table and stuff. Here is a T-Rex skull. Um, obviously that's millions of dollars. That's from like a billionaire in this house. Um, but that's not what amateurs do. Amateurs do so much more than just have fossils like laying on their dining room tables and stuff. Uh, so what I wanna do is kind of just talk about why they're important, uh, why they're actually vital in the field of paleontology. So I wouldn't just go through like six topics. Some are pretty obvious and then others are a little bit more nuanced there, but we'll just kind of go through like six topics as to why they're you know, valuable in the field of paleontology. 
So to start, we just got to talk about what an amateur or avocational paleontologist is. And this room is full of, there's like 30 some here right now. Um, and there's some professionals I see too. So uh, what the definition is, at least uh, what we came up with at Paleontological Society is a person who's enthusiastic and interested in the study of fossils, uh, whose professional work is in some other kind of field. And often they're deeply knowledgeable and or trained in aspects of paleontology. So that's what we came up with a few years ago. They might have adjusted the definition a little bit, but the key word there is that second uh, sentence there. They're deeply knowledgeable and or trained in aspects of paleontology. So everybody here in this uh, rock room right now is an expert in some aspect of paleontology. So when you combine that all together, you actually have a lot of power. You actually have a lot of knowledge uh, to share, uh, to share out and to help uh, professional paleontology. So uh, just an example here I have, um, this is my uh, collecting buddy, Lee Cohn. Um, he's like the expert on North and South Carolina tertiary fossils. And then that picture to the right there is, it's called the cone whale. It's not described yet. Um, it's a new species of whale. It'll probably be named after him and there's still publications being made about it. But um, he found that in that, uh, the, you know, the Lee Creek, the Aurora phosphate mine, uh, where you can still collect in it. And if he didn't find that, that fossil would have been destroyed by the mining activity. Uh, so he found a whole new uh, species of whale in there that's uh, currently being researched on. And if you don't know Lee, which I hope you do, but if you don't know Lee, um, you know Mary Anning. She's technically an amateur paleontologist. Uh, she was around before paleontology existed. Uh, there were naturalists, but she was a female and she was poor. So there's no way that she could actually become a naturalist in the field. Um, so what she did in Lyme Regis, she uh, just collected uh, shells, seashells. Um, you know, at the she's at the seashore there, uh, like amnites and stuff. And she found pliosaurs, she found a pterosaur, all kinds of things. She became the expert of Dorset fossils. Um, so many experts from London who actually come down and visit her, they would buy her specimens. And now she has specimens all through the British Museum, all through museums around the uh, earth. I'm sure you've seen uh, some of some casts of her specimens. So she is really, really important, but she would actually be considered an avocational paleontologist or an, an amateur paleontologist. Uh, if you don't know uh, her, which probably do, uh, the Sternberg family, you probably know like the Sternberg Museum. Uh, they're an amateur fossil hunting family. Uh, they sold countless specimens to museums. Their fossils are displayed all over the world. Uh, they started off in Kansas and then they moved up uh, in uh, Canada up to Lance Creek Formation. And you probably know some of their specimens, like the middle one here is the Sternberg mummy. That's, um, that's an American Museum of Natural History now, but that's probably the best preserved Edmontosaurus ever. Um, it almost looks like it's just kind of got hit by like a cow, hit by a car on a road or something. It's still there in life position. And then uh, one of their sons, George, actually went and found Dinosaur Provincial Park up in Canada. So these were pure amateurs. Um, eventually, uh, Charles uh, got the honorary title of paleontologist, but for most of the time, they were amateurs, including George. And they found these world-class specimens that are now in museums, and they actually found, helped found a dinosaur park. Uh, so again, amateurs are really, really important. Now, I could go on for like hours to talk about you know, different uh, people. Um, but uh, let's uh, kind of just move on here and go through some lists here. So why are paleontologists um, not just important, but vital to paleontology? And actually they're so important that um, the two major paleontological societies, the SVP and the PS have annual awards that recognize contributions by animals or amateurs. So the SVP has a Skinner Award and the PS has the Strumple Award. Um, but each year they award an amateur uh, and recognize them for their con contributions to the field. And uh, Bruce McFadden, uh, he was a president of the Paleontological Society. Uh, he did a survey with 42 paleontologists, 81% interacted with avocational paleontologists. And these are good interactions. These aren't bad interactions there. And 25% that said that they have significant interactions. So paleontologists use amateurs. Um, so it must be vital to paleontology. So first thing I wanna look at here is I get rid of it. There we go. I can't see my own screen. Okay, so first thing I want uh, to talk about then is uh, one of the more obvious ones, uh, just to contribute specimens. Um, most amateurs, if you find something scientific, uh, a lot of times they'll donate it to a museum, find an appropriate institution to uh, donate it to. This one's kind of obvious, so let's kind of just go through some examples of this. So the reason why uh, we contribute a lot of specimens is that we vastly outnumber professionals. Uh, professionals don't nearly have as much time or manpower just to scour fossil sites for specimens, but amateurs, we do, we love it. Like last weekend, we're out at the, at the quarry looking for trail bites and stuff. Like it's fun. Like we like that kind of stuff. And uh, someone, uh, just to sum up is uh, Michael Gibson. He's a paleontologist at the University of Tennessee. He has a really, really good relationship with the amateur fossil hunters down in uh, Western Tennessee. 
And uh, his quote kind of sums it all up. Without the eyes and legs of West Tennessee amateur fossil collectors, many of the specimens would be lost to science. They would be uncollected, they would erode away, and uh, we wouldn't know about them. And uh, that picture is of him, and it's kind of funny. Um, that is not a fossil from Tennessee. I think when, uh, when they're doing the uh, photography session, they didn't want to hold the little bracket pods and stuff. They want to hold something bigger. So uh, they give them a big skull to hold. Kind of weird. So how much uh, specimens do amateurs contribute? Uh, one of the stats floating around is over 75% of all fossils in museums were actually donated or found by amateur collectors. So if you find a dinosaur, you're not going to obviously collect it, um, but you can uh, you know, uh, let a museum know and then they can collect it and stuff. Um, but 75% fossils. So if there weren't amateurs looking for this stuff, all the shelves of museums, all the displays would be bare. And if you think about it, like the American Museum of Natural History has, I think 30 to 40 million uh, fossil specimens. Uh, the Smithsonian has like 36 or 37 million specimens. Um, cut that down by, uh, you know, 75%. That's tens of millions of specimens. If you look at the museums worldwide, that could be hundreds of millions of specimens donated by amateurs. And I just wanted to double check that uh, statistic, that 75%. Uh, so Victor Perez, uh, he works at the, he's a paleontologist at the Kelvin Marine Museum. Um, I talked to him approximately 45,000 of the house specimens, 75% were donated by amateur fossil collectors. So those numbers match up exactly. It's probably just coincidence. Um, but again, you get that high number, that's 75%. Uh, so it's, it's vital that amateurs find these specimens and contribute them. So I just want to just go through a couple of examples of some, uh, you know, some contributions here. So one person, uh, Jack uh, Kelmeyer, uh, he's a really nice guy. Uh, when I first met him, I actually thought he was a paleontologist, uh, but he's just an amateur paleontologist, but he has his own invertebrate paleontology research collection. It's curated at the University of Ohio. Um, most um, most uh, publications that come out of Ohio, when they're researching stuff on the Cincinnati Arch, uh, they reference his collection, they look through his collection. The collection consists of over 15,000 specimens. So one amateur has his entire uh, research collection at a university with 15,000 specimens. Uh, another example is the Florida Museum of Natural History. Uh, where did it get the world's second largest collection of vertebrate fossils? where well, there's an amateur collector uh, named John Waldrop. He donated over 40,000 vertebrate specimens to the Florida Museum all at once, not just throughout the years, but he made this giant massive donation a few years ago. Um, he's been collecting these fossils since the 1960s and most of the locations are now developed over. So if he hasn't, hadn't collected these, those fossils would have been lost to science. And now uh, there's 40,000 of them that's being curated at the Florida Museum of Natural History. And he's always worked closely with the Florida Museum. Um, there's a quote down there by Bruce McFadden um, at the Florida Museum of Natural History. He, again, he really uh, loves amateur fossil hunters and works closely with them. And um, uh, he's, you know, he just has good stuff to say about uh, John Waldrop. So again, I could talk about people forever, about um, their uh, contributions, but it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, specific people. Um, you can take an example of a fossil location like Maison Creek, world famous place. It has a uh, logger salt concretions where you have all the soft tissue preservation and stuff. And uh, fossils were originally found in the creeks. Uh, strip mining operations actually exposed the majority of the fossils. And people that collected them originally were mine employees and then other amateur fossil collectors that were, uh, that were there. They would actually collect the concretions. Uh, eventually the Chicago Field Museum, they actually set up a field station in the area. However, even with that field station and with paleontologists collecting, most of the fossils acquired by the field station were actually donated by amateur fossil collectors. And they were working with the lead paleontologist at the field station. Again, that lead paleontologist had a really good relationship with the local amateur fossil collectors. So most of those Maison Creek fossils that the museum actually collected were actually from amateurs, uh, you know, with their boots on the ground, searching and scouring for these things. So that one's kind of obvious, contributing specimens. Again, you could have up to hundreds of millions of specimens, 75% of all fossils in museums contributed by amateur fossil hunters. So a second reason why avocational paleontologists or amateur fossil hunters, whatever you want to call them, are vital is uh, that we volunteer. We actually um, uh, have use our hours to volunteer for paleontology. So we love, like I do, we all do, we love, enjoy, we enjoy being in the field and we like to participate in science. So volunteering at museums and dig sites actually provide this opportunity. And what is called is citizen science. So it allows us to participate in citizen science. Uh, most museums and dig sites have some type of volunteer program. 
And some of them are overwhelmingly volunteer driven, like, like almost everyone there are volunteers. Just a picture here, this is uh, the Belgrade Quarry up in uh, North Carolina. And all of the people you see there is uh, amateurs uh, just fossil collecting. And this is uh, run by the Fleur Museum Natural History uh, by Bruce McFadden again. Um, but all of the people on the picture there are amateurs again. And uh, they periodically have trips up there. And if it's a common fossil, they catalog all the fossils and then the amateurs uh, keep all the common fossils like the shark teeth and the kinoderms and stuff. And only if it's um, uh, scientifically valuable or rare, they will keep it and then they'll curate it in their collection. Because they don't want hundreds of thousands of shark teeth and stuff, they want the, the more rare stuff. Uh, but they still keep track of the numbers of things. So amateurs get to keep the common finds and they're contributing to science. So just some examples of volunteering. Uh, Montbrook. Uh, this is the largest freshwater land vertebrate site in the state of Florida. Uh, the landowners, um, actually their daughter, I think she was like, like less than 10, maybe she was like eight years old, just walked around and found some fossils. It's a sand pit where they excavate sand. Um, like they, I guess they mine sand there. Um, but uh, the daughter brought back a bunch of little fossils and the landowner realized they, they weren't the normal variety of fossils. So he contacted the University of Florida and now uh, he allows them to excavate the site. And most of the excavators are volunteers. Uh, since its discovery in 2015, over 700 volunteers, over 700 amateur paleontologists has worked at that site. They collect the fossils, they clean the fossils, they curate the fossils, they even research on the fossils. And uh, this is almost entirely volunteers. There's very few paleontologists there that just oversee the volunteer army. And just one more is a gray fossil site. Uh, this is probably one of the most important fossil sites east of Mississippi. Um, it's the only early Pliocene land mammal site in Appalachia. And it's actually the largest uh, assemblage of uh, tapers. Uh, it's overseen by the East Tennessee State University and it's volunteer driven. They actually um, uh, run volunteer drives to try and get more volunteers off season. Um, so they're constantly trying to find volunteers to help dig and help excavate. Um, each season, they get about 100 volunteers to excavate, prep, and catalog fossils. So this picture here, you see volunteers ex excavating here. And I'm sure this is like some kind of taper fossil because it's big. Uh, but there's just like papers all over the place there. Um, but if you go there and visit, you'll see volunteers um, digging and excavating at the site. So I can go on for hours about examples. Um, these are just some ones um, I could just think of off the top of my head. Um, no, no assemblies of order, no alphabet or anything like that. You got the Mammoth site in South Dakota. You got the Waco National Mon Monument, Thomas Farm, uh, a bunch of other ones. Uh, when I was at the Librea Tar Pits, um, I was kind of amazed that when you look at each little pit, each little excavation center, um, there's a bunch of volunteers actually excavating there. Uh, so without volunteers, um, again, none of this stuff would get excavated. There's just not enough paleontologists to do it. So a third reason is uh, we actually contribute money and resources. So to do this, an individual uh, really doesn't have a big, big effect unless you're like a millionaire. Uh, but we have a little secret weapon. So this Death Star picture here, I picked the Death Star, on, I like Star Wars, but I picked the Death Star on purpose. If you look closely, if you know, if you've watched Star Wars and know how this thing operates, all these little tiny laser beams come together and make one giant great beam. So amateur paleontologists can do the same thing. They have a secret weapon. So if they all come together, they don't make this super death laser. Instead, they form a club. So this is um, some clubs off the My Fossil website. They kind of keep track of like major clubs. Uh, there's about 60 major clubs. There's a bunch of smaller ones also, like the Rock Room. I couldn't find the Rock Room on here, uh, but uh, these are like uh, just larger clubs. Um, and there's about 60 of them in North America. So what a club is, is just a group of amateurs that come together and just share their experiences. And oftentimes club have uh, membership fees and drives and, uh, you know, fossil, fossil uh, auctions and stuff to create money. And if you think about it, there are 60 active clubs and they have about 12,000 total members. And again, it's mostly amateurs and again, sprinkled with a few professionals here and there, but it's, it's overwhelming, overwhelmingly amateurs. So a club culminates that power of amateurs, giving them more reach. So that's uh, kind of why it's like a secret web, like uh, what Kirk has here. So again, the money is raised through like membership dues, fossil fears, auctions, and very similar things like that. And how much money did amateurs contribute to the professional field of paleontology? So not all of that money goes to professional paleontology, a small amount does, um, but um, uh, amateur 
uh, Linda McCall um, actually surveyed 15 clubs. This was back in 2016. Uh, she surveyed 16 clubs. Again, a big survey thing. And one of the questions is how much do you donate? The 15 clubs donate over 16,000 in grants, donations, and scholarships to paleontology. So if you average that with 60 clubs, that's $64,000 that amateurs give to professionals. And what are these grants, donations, and scholarships? Like how they actually give this money to professionals. So what I did, I, I broke down the club that Linda McCall's in. And uh, whoops, not that, this is the Lower uh, Valley Paleo Society. This was um, you know, up, up by you guys here. Uh, what they have is the Paul Bond Scholarship. Since 1997, uh, they give an annual scholarship to students pursuing graduate degree in the field of paleontology. And uh, as of uh, this year, there's been 21 recipients and each recipient gets $1,500. Now, $1,500 doesn't sound like a lot uh, for grad school, uh, but remember, these are uh, paleo grad students. If you've ever met them, uh, they're living off of like ramen noodles and frozen pizza and stuff. So $1,500 $1, like a lot for them. But um, total, that's $31,500 they gave to students uh, to support them in, in their grad studies. So that's uh, the Paul Bond Scholarship. The DVPS also does other things. Uh, they have grants. Uh, these grants are awarded at the discretion of, of the officers and a total of $8,500 um, so far have been awarded. Um, I didn't get the update uh, with a couple COVID years. This was a few years ago. Um, everything's kind of stopped with the COVID stuff in 2021 there. Um, but as of 2019, it was 8,500 bucks. And some examples of uh, where that money went is a new microscope and camera for the Red Hill Field Museum. Um, they sponsor the Rowan Fossil Park Fossil Day occasionally. Uh, they donate a few times to Waco Mammoth National Monument. Uh, the Inverson Morrow Pit in New Jersey. And uh, they funded some uh, research at Red Hill uh, just to research some of the specimens and stuff. Uh, so again, that's 8,500 has been given to the field of paleontology to help fund things. So again, uh, if you look at almost any club, uh, you're gonna see that there's money being contributed to professionals um, through scholarships, through grants, and uh, through other means. Most of those 60 clubs do some kind of outreach like that. Um, and again, that's 60 some, what was that, $63,000 annually uh, given to professionals. So another uh, reason why we're vital to paleontology is public outreach. And I heard uh, some, of you, uh, uh, some of the public outreach like that, you're getting that truck of uh, sediment for people to dig through and stuff. So public outreach has a lot of benefits. Um, it, it promotes paleontology. It fosters the next generation of paleontologists. Um, so I think this picture here, um, I, this is independent, this is not through a club, but I do these uh, little fossil digs um, at, at various places, like this is a local heritage day. So out of all those kids, maybe someone will get interested and maybe someone will eventually become a paleontologist or at least do something uh, more in science there. So if we look at uh, just this sample club, the North Carolina Fossil Club, these are the type of outreach events that they do. They take school and scouting groups on fossil collecting trips. They give presentations and fossil programs to civic centers and schools. Uh, they set up displays at public events. They set up fossil ID st stations at local beaches. In North Carolina, uh, you can find fossils um, along the beaches there. So they'll actually put a little ID station and stuff. And I think the picture here, this is at the state capitol. Um, they have your learn your state or know your state day, where they have like the state bird, the state flower, the state tree. So uh, the North Carolina Fossil Club sets up megalodon teeth, which is the state fossil. Uh, so kids, kids can learn about the state fossil there. So how much public outreach do amateurs do? Um, just out of that uh, same survey that Linda McCall did, there's 15 clubs, they conducted 185 events annually and gave away about 500 pounds of fossils per club. Um, so that's a lot of pounds of fossils going to children. If you multiply that by the 60 clubs, that's 739 outreach events every year and 15 tons of fossils they give away. That has to foster interest uh, to individuals. And again, this doesn't include all the independent outreach by individuals. This is only just the uh, those 60 uh, main fossil clubs. So how many future paleontologists have they created with these outreach events? Uh, that this is vital to paleontology to, to do this outreach and to foster that next generation of paleontologists. Uh, just uh, one more thing is, and this is uh, this can get a little bit more controversial, um, but uh, amateurs can actually provide access to fossil rich sites. So this is uh, kind of annoying for me. Um, how many times have you like drove to a fossil site to see a strip mall or housing plan sitting on it? Uh, I remember uh, back when I started to get uh, into fossil collecting, um, I drove to New Jersey with uh, one of my uh, fossil friends, Wrong Way Rob, because he always drives the wrong way. 
and uh, we're looking for dinosaur footprint sites in New Jersey. And I said, he always drives the wrong way. He was giving me directions. We ended up crossing the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. It took like hours to get back. Um, but we spent two days looking for dinosaur tracks. Uh, we pulled into a housing plan. We pulled into a soccer field. We pulled into a strip mall. Uh, we found no tracks at all. There's tracks there, but all the places that we went to, they were all built and developed over. All the tracks were destroyed already. So professional paleontologists often don't have the resources or grant money to lease or purchase fossil bearing land, but uh, some amateurs do. So just some examples here. It's just easier to give the examples uh, than to explain it, but uh, the Coopers, uh, like uh, you guys probably all have know or heard of uh, Dan Cooper um, and his two sons, Ben and Jason. It, it's like a family business side, uh, US trilobites. Uh, Dan Cooper and his sons, they search for fossil bearing sites, they lease the land, and then they excavate and prep the fossils. And most of it are sold for profit um, because, again, they have to, you know, they have to make a living here. Um, but others, more scientifically valuable ones, are donated to scientific in institutions. So some examples of some of their land, uh, they, they have a bunch of spots now, but uh, one of the original ones was Mount Orab. Uh, Dan Cooper, uh, he permits the use of his uh, private quarry for scientific use. So if you're a paleontologist, you can set up an appointment and go to that place to uh, excavate the trilobites there. And uh, that place has those uh, nice flexicalamine and the big isoteus trilobites. And uh, many of the specimens from this quarry are actually housed in museums. If you ever see like a real big isoteus, um, chances are it came from this quarry. It came from Dan Cooper and he donated it. Um, Jason Cooper, um, he has a lease up in the Morris Information. It's called Scott. Skull Creek Quarry. Um, that quarry, he found the largest Tarvosaurus ever. And uh, there's tons of other articulated Jurassic dinosaurs that he found. And a number of these are now in museums. So without these, these amateurs, because they're not professional paleontologists, uh, but without these amateurs purchasing this land and excavating them for fossils, none of these things would be in museums. We'd be missing a bunch of dinosaurs from that Morrison lease. We'd be missing a bunch of those giant isotest trilobites from Mount Aura. Again, he has a bunch of other land. Uh, another uh, example is the Dry Dredgers Fossil Club. Um, Dan Cooper is actually a member. This is a really, really nice club. Um, they actually established the Trammell Fossil Park. Um, there's a couple of members, Stephen Felton and Jack uh, Kalmeyer, whom I talked about before. They worked very closely with the Trammell family to secure the rights and preserve the fossil locality. And now it's a really famous fossil park in Ohio. So again, without this uh, group of amateurs in this club, we would not have Trammell Fossil Park. Uh, that's that's kind of like um, Dinosaur Provincial Park, an amateur helped find that. Uh, same thing with Trammell Fossil Park. Uh, one other example is uh, Marcus Martin. Uh, you might know him as uh, Goldbugs, Goldbugs official. Um, he bought the quarry uh, in the famous Beecher's Trilobite bed to harvest his pyrotized uh, triarthus trilobites. Um, I'm sure you've seen them, but if you haven't, there's a little picture of one. They're uh, pyrotized, so it has all the soft tissue. Um, they're really, really neat uh, trill bikes. And uh, he leases the land, so he sells them for a living to make a living, but also donates scientifically valuable specimens to institutions. Uh, he also allows paleontologists and other groups to dig in the quarry. Um, when he first bought the place, he actually um, uh, contacted a ton of paleontologists in the area. To, hey, you want to come? You want to look at the quarry? You want to dig in here? And um, he made lots of discoveries. Uh, he found the first trail bike with eggs. Uh, that's been published on. He has seven published papers just from trilobites from this quarry. 178 specimens are at the Yale Peabody Museum, and there's many others in museums across the world. If you, uh, you ever see a pyrotized trilobite, it probably came from this uh, quarry, and if it wasn't found in the 1800s, it was probably from Marcus Martin. Um, so he has these trilobites in museums globally all over the world. If he didn't lease that land, there might be a strip mall there by now. Um, so again, he kind of uh, uh, rescued these fossils, and now they're in museums worldwide. And again, first trail bite with eggs and seven other scientific papers have been published. Uh, just one last one is the Green River Formation. Uh, as we've all heard of that, uh, the Eocene logger stock deposit uh, contains fish, but also has those really rare birds, insects, reptiles, and mammals. Um, numerous commercial pay to dig quarries operate in the formation. The quarries, they produced hundreds of thousands of new specimens including many new scientifically valuable specimens. A lot are sold, they're private quarries or commercial quarries, um, but many of the scientific ones are actually in museums now, in educational institutions. A uh, good example is uh, Warfield Fossils. It's one of the commercial quarries. Um, that's one of the older quarries there. Um, they found 13 new species, um, including a primitive taper that's on the uh, Wyoming State Museum. 
So these scientifically valuable specimens make their ways into museums and institutions where they can be properly researched. So without these private uh, quarries uh, leasing the land in the Green River, none of this stuff will have been found. And uh, the picture here, this is uh, one famous horse fossils they found, um, articulated horse fossil in the uh, Green River Formation. There is an early Eocene horse uh, complete, complete specimen there. So the last thing I want to talk about is that uh, amateurs also, they research and publish. Uh, so they just don't find fossils, they help research and publish on the fossils. And uh, this is um, about uh, just the dry dredgers group again. Again, it's a really nice uh, group um, and they work really, really closely with um, the local museums there and the paleontologists. And uh, one of the paleontologists this is an old quote, but one of the paleontologists there um, said that there has not been a paper written by myself or my students at the University of Cincinnati and related to fossil locations in the last 45 years in which dry dredger contributions of material have not had a significant role, sometimes a dominant one. So out of 45 years of publications and research, um, there's not been one that didn't reference the, some contribution from one of the members, one of the amateur members of the dry dredgers. And many amateurs are mentioned in peer reviewed papers based off their finds. Uh, Robert Bossenecker, um, he works at the Mace Brown Museum, a paleontologist down there in South Carolina in Charleston. Um, he's very involved with amateurs down there, but before he moved there, he was actually in California and uh, he published a paper um, on the Santa, uh, Santa Margarita sandstone in Santa Cruz County. Um, he reported that 44% of publications mentioned fossils collected by amateurs. Um, so 44% of scientific publications um, have amateur found fossils in the publications. These are uh, two of my more recent ones. Um, there's some dinosaur bones from 2020 and then uh, a shark vertebra, um, new genus of species from 2000 or 2021 there. Um, but uh, this isn't really what I'm talking about. Um, what I'm talking about is they actually research and they publish their own work. They're not just, uh, their fossils aren't just featured in the stuff. Uh, so here's some examples. These are some people that I've talked about already. Uh, Linda McCall, she's the lead author on four papers and co-author on one peer-reviewed publication. Uh, Jack Kalmeyer, uh, he's a lead or co-author on 10 peer-reviewed publications. Uh, William Heimbrock, uh, he works up with the dry dredgers there. He's an amateur. Um, he's a co-author on nine peer-reviewed publications. They all help write these papers. Uh, Lee Cohn, uh, the, the lead author on four conference papers. And uh, Marcus Martin, again, he did uh, seven peer-reviewed publications he was a co-author on. So again, they don't just find the fossils and give them to paleontologists, they help paleontologists research fossils. Um, they help them write the papers, they help them write the drafts of the publications. So that is why I believe uh, paleont uh, avocational paleontologists are vital to paleontology. They contribute the specimens, millions upon millions of specimens. They volunteer thousands and thousands of man hours at the quarries. Uh, they contribute tens of thousands of dollars yearly. Uh, they, they do public outreach. Uh, they form the minds of uh, young generation of paleontologists. If they do the 700 outreach events per year, that's thousands of children they're affecting. Uh, some of them provide access to fossil rich sites. Uh, without amateurs buying some of that land, uh, you don't have access to those to get those rare fossils like the trail bites with the eggs. And again, they, they also, they research and they publish papers, uh, just like what professionals do. Um, so they are vital to the field of paleontology. So uh, with uh, that, I'm going to end it here. And uh, just um, without amateurs, uh, paleontological research and new discoveries will basically slow to a crawl. Let me uh, stop sharing here. And I'm not sure how fast I went through that, but uh, anybody have any questions? If you want to put them into the chat, we'll be watching the chat too. I did visit the uh, the Gray Fossil Site one time, Jason, and uh, pretty incredible site down there just off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee, so easy to get to. Yeah. It's just crazy the amount of uh, cheaper fossils they have there. No questions yet, but um, just very cool presentation. Thank you. Very nice, inspirational.
Okay, here we have one. When did you start collecting? Uh, about the year 2000, uh, when I was in college, I uh, would go hiking and there's like a quarry there that I hiked along. I found like a trace fossil. Uh, so I always kept trying to get identified and there's just nothing out there to really uh, help me with identification. So that's when I started the website and stuff too. Um, on this, right when I started to find fossils. Feeling very inspired right now. Thanks so much. Excellent. Really well organized and presented. Nice presentation. Good point. And uh, if you don't like the presentation again, blame Andrew. He, uh, I gave him a list of topics and he picked that one. No, I think that was great. I thoroughly enjoyed it actually. Yeah. That, was, that was very nice. I, I liked it. <laughs> Joseph is asking, was the website helpful? Uh, my website? Uh, so yes, Joseph? So, yes, I originally started the website to try and get my fossils identified because um, there wasn't really a lot of fossil sites out there in 2000, like the internet was still kind of young. Um, so um, it wasn't actually that helpful for me uh, to get my fossils identified. But then once I got into paleontology, people started email me about, you know, identifying their fossils. So I have like God uh, over, you know, dozen or two dozen sites now with fossil identification. So it, it helps other people. It never helped me, but it helps a bunch of other people. Hey, your website has a incredible amount of information on it. Uh, can you find out about to volunteer at? Um, my fossil site has uh, a list of volunteer things. Also, if you just type in on uh, on the internet, um, paleontology volunteer or dig site volunteer, uh, it'll uh, get you to a lot of stuff. Um, if you know a specific place you want to volunteer at, you can go to a specific place and there's usually some type of volunteer program. Um, I know all the museums I'm associated with um, all have volunteer programs and stuff. And what's the name of the website? Uh, fossilguy.com. So uh, Jason, do you enjoy collecting a certain fossil over other fossils or everything? Uh, everything, yeah. I, I just enjoy being outside uh, collecting. Um, a lot of times I don't find much or find anything, but it doesn't matter. It's just out there looking, um, knowing that you might find something that no one's ever seen before. Um, so yeah, I just like to get out there. I, I like shark teeth. I like trilobites. I like cetaceans. I like dinosaurs, ammonites, um, anything. Yes, yeah, it's, it's more just about getting outdoors and looking like uh, if you can incorporate like boating and kayaking and camping and traveling around. You actually helped me out. Uh, you probably didn't know me at that point in time, but about four years ago, you helped me out with a, a bus trip I was taking in the West Virginia. Uh, were you with the, um, the big group? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, we did okay. Uh, we did okay with uh, the four stops we did. So, uh, did did you end up going that place? Yep. The yeah, Lost River. Yeah. Just because it, of the, I, I needed another stop, and I had to take I had right. to take it to, to get a stop in there. Did they find trail bikes? Yes, they did. I remember that. Yeah, they got, I kind of climb up like toward that high wall area. The high wall, yeah. Yes. Two yeah. kids came down, uh, all excited. Oh, that's good. Holding a uh, partial. That's good. I'm trying to remember the name of the collector of dinosaur. He's now in the trial bites uh, over in Reading. Um, he's done a lot of research. Uh, he's worked with universities, and I swear that guy, uh, I swear he has a, a nose like a dog looking for fossils. Says, I brought him to York County one time just to let him look at some sites uh, that I was uh, narrowing in on. He and he he just went right here, and uh, we found some stuff like how'd you know it was right there? <laughs> I always have I always have bad luck. 
Yeah, I can't remember. Like, it, probably, like find stuff, and then I'm like, where? Okay. It's still still fun. Andrew says we need to get into those sinkholes. Oh, I was I was replying to Stephen. Uh, the, we need to get into Marvin's uh, sinkholes on the adjoining property to New Paris. <laughs> <laughs> He'll let us come there and visit. Uh, I'm not sure if we'd be allowed to go down into them, but um, I know they're open. The, the sinkholes are open. They're all on his property. Next dirt man's report. <laughs> um, if you and Jason or anyone else wants to come back to New Paris uh, for the day, uh, just a few of us and spend the day looking for trilobites, let me know. Well, thank you. Oh. All right, anybody else have anything else? Uh, this has been videoed and will be on YouTube. I, I believe we have a YouTube cha channel out there now. Uh, and actually the Jones Geological Services website is gonna be totally designed here, redesigned here very, very soon. And things might be a little bit easier to find. So anyway, it is. Uh, it will be uh, on YouTube here pretty shortly. All right, I don't see any less questions. Jason, thank you again for being with us. And thanks to Andrew for getting you here. Uh, well, very well presented program. And all that. So did y'all hear about the artist that went to jail? He thinks he got framed. All right, yeah, I don't, I didn't laugh either. I did a chicken barbecue this past Saturday uh, for the church, and uh, somebody once told me they went into Walmart to buy a chicken, and when they went to the checkout counter, they asked the cashier, the legs in my chicken, are they the front legs or the back legs? The cashier kind of looked at it a little strange and went through all of her literature looking for the answer, Went back to the manager to ask, and the cashier came back up and looked at the guy and said, "That's not funny." So, uh, you know, chicken only had two legs anyway. So that's just like here; it wasn't funny. All right, uh, Jerry. Uh, Chris is asking if the June twenty sixth. Northwest Trail Geology Hike, is it at 12 or 2? It's 12 o'clock. Yep, 12 o'clock noon on June 26th. You're going to have a busy weekend. Yeah, it will be. Okay, Brittany, you want to take us out of here? Sure. Thanks, Jason. That was great. Um, good to see everybody and have a good is it two weeks or three weeks this time. I think, think we'll see you in June. Three weeks, yeah. Yeah, three weeks. Ready? Bye, everyone. We'll see ya.